What causes lightning? Lightning can be a beautiful and scary part of Earth's weather. You probably have seen lightning in a thunderstorm, but do you know why lightning happens? Lightning comes from electrical charges that build up within a storm cloud. Thunderstorms form when warm, moist air rises high into the atmosphere. This rising air is called an updraft. As air rises in the atmosphere, clouds form when water vapor in the air cools into water drops, called cloud droplets. Some cloud droplets freeze into ice crystals. These cloud droplets and ice crystals collide and form larger particles called graupel. As the ice crystals rise up, they collide with the larger and heavier graupel. These collisions result in positively and negatively charged particles. Ice crystals are small and light. The updraft carries the positively charged ice crystals higher and higher into the cloud. The thunderstorm cloud is mostly negatively charged, which causes a mostly positive charge to form on the ground. When these opposite charges become strong enough, there is an electrical discharge, an energy release in the form of lightning. Lightning often connects the negative charges in the cloud to positive charges on the ground. This is called cloud to ground lightning. Why does lightning often hit trees, telephone poles, or other tall structures first? Trees and telephone poles are often the tallest objects on the ground. So, they are closest to the storm cloud and the first thing in the path of lightning. Lightning can also stay within a cloud or even travel between two clouds. This happens when lightning travels from a negative charge in one cloud to a positive charge within another cloud. This is known as intracloud lightning. By the time you see lightning in the sky, a storm is probably already underway in your neighborhood. But tracking lightning from space can help meteorologists predict the intensity of a storm. NOAA's Gozar series weather satellites captured this imagery of lightning during a series of thunderstorms over the Midwestern United States. Imagery and information from these satellites help forecasters to predict the intensity of a storm and whether or not the storm will produce high winds or tornadoes. Find out more about Earth's weather at NOAA SciJinx. Due to its molten iron core, the Earth has a magnetic field around it, just like a bar magnet. This magnetic field extends outwards into space, forming a big bubble that we call the magnetosphere. The inner layer of the magnetosphere, from near the Earth's surface up to a thousand or so kilometers, is called the ionosphere because it is made up of particles ionized by radiation from the Sun. In low-frequency radio astronomy, when we point our telescopes to the sky to measure the faint signals that travel through space to reach us, we need to take structures and perturbations in the ionosphere into account that might change these signals. We need a good understanding of the effects of the ionosphere to make sense of our data. Pictured near the surface, the Earth's magnetic field lines run parallel and come out at an angle to the ground. It has long been postulated that tubular plasma structures go along the magnetic field lines, and it is structures like these that can affect our astronomical measurements. Previously, people could only guess what they might look like, since no one has ever been able to image them.
We're surrounded by fluids every day. Air, water, blood, but weirdly, remarkably little is known about the way fluids move. All fluid flow is governed by a set of equations called the Navier-Stokes equations. Think of them as Newton's second law, as applied to the movement of a mass of fluid. But the problem is, we can only solve the Navier-Stokes equations for a small number of special cases. For example, we can write down an equation that describes how fluid moves slowly through a long straight pipe. If the fluid is moving much faster, however, the flow becomes turbulent and we no longer have an exact solution. This leaves us with a couple of options. We can either remove less important terms to find solutions that describe only some of the dynamics we're interested in, or we can use huge computers to find extremely good approximations to solutions for us. Coming up with a smooth, globally defined solution to the Navier-Stokes equation is such a huge and important problem that the Clay Mathematics Institute is offering a million dollars to anyone who can do it. If you have two pieces of tape, you can calculate the gravitational force that they, in principle, exert on each other according to the law of universal gravitation, but it's far too ridiculously, ridiculously small for you to ever have the remotest chance of noticing any effect whatsoever, let alone actually checking that the attraction between them follows the law of universal gravitation as you move the bits of tape farther apart. In contrast, if you stick the two pieces of tape together and then pull them apart, they'll exchange some electric charge and then measurably attract each other, an electrical attraction which is a million billion times stronger than the predicted gravitational attraction, and whose strength has allowed us to confirm Coulomb's law of electrical attraction to a very, very, very high degree of accuracy. So it makes sense to apply Coulomb's law of electrical attraction to objects at normal human scales. But testing Newton's law of gravitation at these scales requires very delicate experiments. In 2015, European Space Agency, or ESA, astronaut Andreas Mogensen was on board the International Space Station, or ISS, photographing the tops of thunderstorms from Earth orbit. And he saw something very interesting indeed. Blue jets. Blue jets are a type of transient luminous event, or TLE, flashes and glows that appear above storms that are results of activity occurring in and below those storms. Blue jets pulse from the tops of intense thunderstorms and reach up toward the edge of space. In January 2017, researchers at Denmark's National Space Institute published their analysis of his observations in geophysical research letters. Mogensen was able to capture clear video as the station flew over the Bay of Bengal, and they were amazed by what that video showed. Olivier Chanrion, lead author of the publication, reported that during 160 seconds of video footage, 245 pulsating blue discharges were observed, corresponding to a rate of about 90 per minute. One of the blue jets observed reached 25 miles, or 40 kilometers, above sea level. Visual evidence of TLEs wasn't available until 1989. Early evidence included red sprites photographed by cameras on board the space shuttle, and photographs taken during a NASA and University of Alaska airborne campaign. Red sprites are glows in the upper atmosphere tied to the presence of large lightning flashes but not attached to the clouds themselves. In recent years, the ISS has afforded astronauts the opportunity to photograph a number of natural light shows produced at the tops of thunderstorms. A 2013 study by researchers from the French Alternative Energies and Atomic Energy Commission analyzed pictures from the NASA Crew Earth Observations Facility aboard the station. The pictures revealed 15 sprites and their parent lightning flashes. In August 2015, the Expedition 44 crew on board the station photographed red sprites over two different storms within three minutes of one another. 
first over the American Midwest, and then near the coast of El Salvador. These sprites reached as high as 62 miles or 100 kilometers above the surface of the Earth. All of these studies are contributing to researchers' understanding of lightning and thunderstorms, how they form and develop over time, and why storms produce different TLEs in different circumstances. However, according to Tim Lang, atmospheric scientist at NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center, TLE studies have been, to an extent, fortunate observation. We've gotten better at finding them, but it's mostly case-based analysis. NASA and partner agencies are advancing in their efforts to make continuous storm observations.